This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Taiga Life is complicated and messy. We don't mean in the normal way that things never quite seem to go the way that you want them to, so that wild adventures and diversions and complications can spin off from even the simple act of going up to the store to get a gallon of milk because your milk went bad and you need your coffee. We mean that life itself is messy. The universe seems like a nice, orderly place filled with rules about elementary particles and forces and so on, and we can make standard models and physics formulae and periodic tables of the elements. But then, when you reach a certain point and the things in the universe start moving around by themselves and eating and growing and reproducing and evolving, things get really crazy. It has been argued by some that the entire field of biology, once you get out of the parts of it that are actually just really complicated chemistry, it has been argued that the field of biology is primarily about grouping, classifying, and naming things. And because of the rich diversity of life that we've been talking endlessly about these last two episodes, that is a very complicated job that involves quibbling over some very fine details. And it often leaves people with questions about just what those fine distinctions are. For example, what actually is the difference between a frog and a toad, a turtle and a tortoise, a hare and a rabbit? And when you start delving into the world's biomes, things get... Oh wait, did you want to know the differences? Okay, let's do those quickly. Frogs have long, powerful hind legs for swimming and jumping, smooth skin covered in mucus, bulbous eyes, and lay eggs in clusters. Toads have short hind legs for walking, rough dry skin, and lay eggs in chains. Tortoises are primarily land-dwelling. Turtles live in water for most or all of their lives. Hares are larger with longer hind legs and ears, are generally antisocial and are fully developed at birth. Rabbits are social, their newborns are hairless, can't regulate their own temperature, and their coats change color with the seasons. Got all that? Good. But we digress. The point is, classifying life is very complicated. Which brings us back around to biomes. See, depending on which list of biomes you look at, you might notice something very odd. Especially if you paid attention to our discussion of forests a few weeks ago. Some lists include forests, and then further break forests down into three types. Tropical, temperate, and boreal and others include forests and taiga as two separate biomes. Why is that odd? Because taiga and boreal forests are the same thing. Both arrangements agree that tropical and temperate forests are close enough to be the same, but they disagree on whether boreal forests are different enough to be different from either of them. See, the thing is, broadly speaking, the taiga is basically a forest. In fact, the word taiga comes from the Russian word for forest. And the other name for the taiga, boreal forest, has forest right in the name. So why do people disagree as to whether it counts as enough of a forest to get lumped in with jungles and temperate forests? Well, it comes down to the difference between leaves and needles. So let's talk about leaves and the most amazing solar power collectors on the planet. A living thing basically survives on its chemical reactions. On a very, very small level, everything your body does is a chemical reaction. And those chemical reactions don't all happen spontaneously. Many chemical reactions require a little kick to get them started. They require energy. Living things use sugar to make the energy they need. Sugar is a great store for chemical energy. It's kind of like a compressed spring. And pulling apart sugar releases that energy. Well, technically, most living things use a high-energy thing called adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. And they make ATP using sugar. So when you eat food, a lot of the energy in the food is turned into sugar, transported around your body, turned into ATP on site where it's needed, 
and then used to power all the chemical reactions that make you work. Now, you and me and other animals get the energy to make the sugar from the food we eat. Most of the food we eat is other living things. And that means all the raw materials have already been turned into sugar and other chemicals by other living things. But most plants, unless they are carnivorous, which we aren't talking about right now because that will just complicate things at the moment, most plants don't really have that option. They can't move, they can't eat, and they can't digest. They can get the carbon and the hydrogen and the oxygen and the nitrogen they need to make all the nutrients they need, including sugar. But they also need energy, and you can't just create energy out of nothing. So they get it from the sun. Green plants are green because of structures called chloroplasts, which comes from Greek meaning to make green. Chloroplasts produce a chemical called chlorophyll, and chlorophyll is an amazing chemical. When a light wave hits it, it starts to vibrate. And vibration is movement. And movement is energy. Now, I have to warn all of the biologists out there that this is a grossly oversimplified explanation. Photosynthesis, the process of making sugar from light, is one of the most complicated chemical reactions in the entire universe. So we need to simplify it a bit. Anyway, the chlorophyll starts to vibrate, and it can then carry that vibration to other chemical structures and pass off the energy. Those other chemical structures then use that vibrating energy to press certain chemicals close together. And in the end, you get sugar produced by energy from the sun. And that is how plants power themselves. This process is extremely important on Earth because you can't make energy out of nothing. Energy has to come from somewhere. And some chemical reactions are okay sources of energy if you're a bacteria or only have to support a small number of cells. But once you get big and complicated, you need a lot of energy. So, green plants capture energy from the biggest honking source of energy in the solar system and convert it into useful nutrients. Then, animals eat the nutrients, and other animals eat those animals, and then those animals die and they decay and the raw materials go back into the ground so more plants can suck them up and use sunlight to turn them into more nutrients. Basically, antelopes eat grass. Lions eat antelopes, lions die and fertilize the grass. And so we're all connected in a great circle of life. Like that Elton John song from Disney's African Savannah retelling of the good parts of Hamlet. Only with a happy ending. But we digress. That brings us around to the taiga and broadleaf deciduous trees and needle-covered conifers. Broadly speaking, you can classify trees as deciduous or coniferous. Again, simplifying a little. Deciduous trees have broad green leaves, and these leaves are absolutely awesome for gathering sunlight. They are like little solar panels, all spread out and facing the sun. And they also have pores, so they can breathe in carbon dioxide. Their undersides are lined with little blowholes. But leaves have a problem. See, plants also need a lot of water to do their thing. And when the plants exhale, they lose water. It transpires, which is a term for plants losing water to the air. Normally, this isn't a problem. Plants just suck up more water from the soil. But in the winter time, there isn't as much water to go around, and the soil freezes, so the water that's there isn't drinkable. And suddenly, the big flat shape of the leaves with lots of breathing holes would just dehydrate the plant to death. So when the weather starts to get cold, leafy trees have a trick. They close off the little tubes that lead to their leaves. The leaves are starved of water and nutrients, stop producing chlorophyll, lose their green, dry out, and die. That's why trees lose their leaves in the winter. At least, Deciduous trees do. Deciduous comes from the same Latin root as descend. Desideri means to fall. Then, 
The tree lives off the stored nutrients deep in their sugar sap filled phloem, which are the fibers in fresh young wood in the hearts of plants that store and transport tree blood. But you do have trees that have figured out another trick. Instead of big, broad leaves that absorb lots of sunlight, these trees have tiny, needle-like leaves with limited surface area. But they make up for the small surface area by having broad, sheet-like branches covered with these needles to snag lots of sunlight. And these trees also exude a waxy substance that locks in moisture. These trees, with their waxy needle-like leaves, can keep their leaves through the winter without dying. But they have to deal with another problem. When snow gathers on the branches, it gets very heavy, and it could snap the branches off the trees. So these trees tend to have a tapered shape to prevent snow from collecting on them. They are shaped like cones, and we call them conifers. Conifers are hardy little trees. Well, actually, they aren't little at all. They can survive on limited nutrients in uniformly low temperatures. In fact, they can thrive in the harshest of forest environments, the taiga. Taiga, or boreal forest, is a forested area in which the temperature stays uniformly low throughout the year. It has harsh winters and short, cool, damp summers. Basically, it has a muddy cool season and a dry frigid season. And because of that, as far as plant life goes, only coniferous trees and mosses and lichens and other evergreen plants can survive. The taiga is actually the largest of the land biomes and covers over 30% of the land's surface on Earth. And that is entirely spread along one belt that goes all the way around the Earth from Scandinavia across Russia, Alaska, and Canada. Basically, if you're between 50 degrees and 70 degrees north latitude, you're in the taiga. In fact, the taiga is so humongous and contiguous compared to other biomes that some ecologists have argued that the entire taiga should be considered one single forest that stretches around the earth like a wintry scarf. And because of that, some ecologists argue that the taiga is not a biome of its own, but a specific type of forest. Others argue that the environment is so different from broadleaf forests that it requires a classification all its own. And that's why it's also called boreal forest. Boreal comes from the Greek word for north. Actually, it comes specifically from the name of one of the four animoi, or wind gods. Boreas was the north wind, bringer of cold. Zephyrus was the west wind, who carried spring air. Nostos came from the south and brought storms. And Eurus was the east wind, and he didn't have any particular job because the Greek climate really only has three distinct seasons. The Animoi were often depicted as formless wind spirits, but in the Odyssey, they were depicted as horses kept by the storm god Aeolus they were also depicted as winged humans. Boreas was depicted often with purple winds. He dwelled in the frozen northern land of Hyperborea, which means beyond the north. And one time, he kidnapped the daughter of King Erichtheus of Athens for his wife and had several children, including a snow goddess and two heroes known as the Boreades. If you're well-versed in the classics, you might recognize the Wind Brothers, Calais and Zethus, as Argonauts who helped rescue Phineas from the Harpies. But perhaps you're familiar with the word boreal from another phrase you've heard. Perhaps you've heard of the Aurora Borealis, or Northern Lights, named for the Roman goddess Aurora, goddess of the dawn and of light, and the Greek Boreas. The northern lights are strange glowing ribbons of multicolored light that sometimes appear in the night sky at extreme northern latitudes. They occur because high energy particles come streaming off the sun all the time. This is called the solar wind. 
Because the Earth is basically a spinning chunk of iron with a rocky planet around it, the Earth is a bit magnetic, and the magnetic field channels those particles to the North and South Poles. Then, those particles hit the air and cause them to light up. Different gases in the air glow different colors. Of course, without an understanding of charged particles, magnetic fields, and excited electron states, the aurora borealis was quite a mystery to various pre-modern cultures. The Cree Indians of North America believed they were the spirits of the dead trying to communicate with the living. The Algonquin Indians thought they were a beacon, a fire lit by Nana Bojo, their creator deity, to remind them that they weren't alone. Maka Indians blamed them on dwarves lighting fires to boil whale blubber. Mandan Indians also thought they were cooking fires, but instead used by northern warriors to boil and eat their enemies. Meanwhile, in Europe, the Icelandic people believed they would ease the passage of new life into the world, and women were encouraged to give birth under the aurora. But they were cautioned not to look at the aurora while giving birth for fear the child would come out cross-eyed. In Greenland, the aurora was believed to be the souls of babies that never made it to Earth due to stillbirth or death during childbirth. And in Norse mythology? Well, you might have heard of the rainbow bridge that connects our world with the lands of the gods, right? You saw Thor, didn't you? Well, guess what inspired that? So, how can you use all of this in your game? An ecological understanding of the world is nice. And if you're running your game in the far north, muddy, swampy, coniferous forests covered with lichens and mosses make for good flavor text for overland travel. But once again, the mythological aspects are what are really interesting. Who carries the seasons? Where do they live? What form do they take? Remember that almost every god that existed only existed to explain a natural phenomenon. And speaking of natural phenomena, what about things like the Northern Lights? What are they in your world? Because in worlds of magic, they probably really are doorways to other worlds or lost souls or something. And they don't have to just occur in the north. Imagine a shimmering curtain that sometimes opens the way to the fairy world or the world of the gods that periodically opens under the sky in some remote nation. If none of that excites you, at least you now know the difference between a dire frog and a dire toad. This has been the GM Word of the Week. It was written by the Angry GM and recorded and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can find more at theangrygm.com and madadventurers.com.